life. He bought me my first overcoat, and so for many years the overcoat I wore in London was the one that he bought for me. Please tell the court um, your association with Timal when, uh, when Timal arrived in London. Well, Timal <coughs> arrived one day, knocked on our flat door, and when I went to open it, I found him standing there and said, what do you want here? <laughs> so he said, no, no, I've come. I've come to London. I was in Mecca. I met with Dr. Tadu and Malvi Kachalia, and I've decided to, to, to come to London. So our flat in London, in North End House, in West Kensington, was, if you like, an open-door flat. There might be 20, 30, 40 people staying there at the same time. So we said, come, welcome. Um, there's a bed, occupy the bed, and, but you have to work, which means you must learn how to wash dishes, you must learn how to wash clean toilets, you must learn how to clean the bathroom, because there's nobody going to do that for you here in England. But he found a teaching job, and so he was able to make a contribution towards uh, buying food and all that in the house. And so that's how we became even closer and had a great deal more time uh, to engage in political discussions because Timor was greatly interested not only in South African politics, in our own struggle politics, but he was also greatly interested in what was happening in the world. What were the international struggles uh, all about? At that time, the CND was a very powerful factor in, in, in British politics that's campaign for nuclear disarmament. And so we had a lot of discussions uh, about international politics. And so our relationship not only became much more closer, but took on a much greater political content because of the continuous discussions that, that, we, that we had. And can you describe the kinds of uh, political activities um, he engaged in, Timal engaged in, while he was in London and abroad? No, we asked him not to, although sometimes he slipped away and joined the CND demonstration, because we said to him that he shouldn't come to these political activities, because the South African security police were obviously keeping an eye on people, and that if he was going to go back home, uh, then it would make it much more dangerous for him to go back home. And so he did not participate in openly anti-apartheid activities taken by the anti-apartheid movement. Uh, what do you know of his recruitment into the SACP? Sorry? Sorry? Uh, what do you know of his recruitment, uh, his joining of the SACP? I would suspect that he, he, he was recruited by Dr. Yusuf Dadu, who was obviously one of the leaders of the South African Communist Party. He was then asked by the leadership of the SACP to go and study at the Institute of Social Sciences School in Moscow, which is also called the Lenin Party School. And he was there together with Tavo Mbeki and Ann Nicholson. Um, I knew that he, he was going there because he, he was given permission to talk to me about going to the Soviet Union, going to, to the party school. So I was aware he was, where he had gone to. Nobody else was aware of that. And uh, so he went to the party school for nearly a year. Uh, when he came back, we had a lot of discussions about uh, what he did at the party school. And, and then he was asked to go back home to you know who work, asked him? work in the underground structure, both of the SACP as well as the ANC. Uh, who asked or instructed him to return to South Africa? I would assume that it would be Yusuf Dadu, and he also received training by Jack Hodson, mm -hmm. because in London, Jack Hodson was principally responsible for training people in how to prepare petrol bombs and so on and so forth, because at that time, one of the methods that we used to distribute our illegal material was by the use of petrol bombs and, and other underground work. So he did receive training, I know that from Jack Hodson. When you mean a petrol bomb, do you mean a, a bucket bomb? A bucket bomb, yes. yes. Um, According to your statement, you were in fact 
The last person to talk to Ahmed Timo before he left for the airport. I and was. During that discussion, you spoke about the, the dangers, particularly dangers that might arise following an arrest. I think what is very important to, to, to understand, and that's what we did discuss about, and I say this in my affidavit, is that the possibilities of him getting arrested were very real. Um, partly gi given the fact that uh, we had been heavily infiltrated by the old security police. Partly that what he was doing was dangerous work and, and he, he could be uh, identified as such. And, and in the course of that discussion, what we were also then discussing is how would one respond? Because we already had enough information about the forms of torture uh, that was used by uh, the security branch officials to obtain information from, from detainees. So we, we had that information. We also knew a lot of people themselves who had uh, been tortured by uh, the apartheid regime. And we had a lot of discussions about that. And um, in the course of those discussions, I think I said to him a number of things. One, I said, look, when the ANC was banned in 1960, and we were asked to do certain things like putting up uh, illegal ANC posters, distributing illegal ANC leaflets and that. All you needed to do was to, if you were arrested, give them your name and address. I think we were a bit idealistic, not realizing what torture can do to people. But for me, and, and that's what we discussed with Ahmed, that it is not treacherous to break under torture. There are some individuals who manage to withstand the worst form of torture. Two of them would, would have been Abdullah Jassat and uh, Lalu Chiba, who withstood the worst form of torture without breaking down, without giving any information. But it's not treacherous to break down under torture. As I say in my affidavit too, there is a limit to human endurance. And we understood that there's a limit to human endurance. The important thing for us in the movement was that if you do break down and you do give information, what you should try to do is limit the information that you give. So that if you know that you worked with a, a number of people, you limit the number of names you would give of people that you worked with in the underground. Secondly, that you would try to, as much as is possible, give this information gradually so that those who had been working with you in the underground or that you had been recruiting would realize that you are under arrest and therefore they would have to then take the necessary measures to protect themselves, which means either they would leave the country, depending on what they were doing, or go into hiding. And that's what we discussed in terms of uh, what are the possible things that could happen to him if he was arrested um, while he was uh, doing the underground work on the movement. It's, it's not in your statement, but did you perchance discuss with Mr. Timal approximately how long he should try and hold out for? Sorry? Uh, did you discuss with Mr. Timal uh, the duration of time that he should try to hold out for if he was uh, arrested and interrogated? A, a day, two days? Not longer? really a duration of time, but so much you, that you try to hold on to as long as it is possible. Because it's impossible to determine, in my view, how any one particular individual to, would respond uh, to the kind of pressures and tortures that was imposed on you. So the, the idea was just hold on for as long as long as you can. Uh, and as I said earlier, if you have to give names, give them in, on a gradual basis. And did you, you discuss the possibility that the police uh, might generate incriminating evidence against uh, Mr. Timon and what he should do in that situation? 
Oh, yes, because it was obvious that uh, all of the other trials that took place that uh, required a lot of the so-called evidence that was being brought forward, incriminating type evidence, was uh, engineered evidence. So we, we discussed that, that it's possible that if he gets arrested, they will find ways and means to incriminate him for a, for a number of things. But it is impossible to say what exactly that would be because you didn't know what information the security police would have about you and what, what, is, it that, what is it that they were then looking for. Uh, and the question of giving evidence against others, was, was that discussed? And that's been the position in the movement, and that's the position that we took. For example, one of my tasks when I returned to England in 1985 was when people came to England and they were going to come back into the underground in the movement, I had to take them for political education. And I took them for political education. And that's one of the things that, that, that we did discuss about uh, the delaying of giving the information, but trying to limit the amount of information you would give that would incriminate somebody else. Not about yourself, because you can tell them all about yourself, because you're incriminating yourself. In any case, once they had arrested you, and it was clear they had the information. And that's what we did discuss, always with, with all our people that, that, that we were involved in, in terms of the kind of political education training we would give them before they came back. According to your statement, um, uh, what was discussed was the possibility of breaking uh, under torture um, and then potentially even agreeing to testify, uh, but then recanting at court and saying, well, in fact, I was tortured and I, I refused to testify. Was that a, a tactic that was uh, discussed with uh, Mr. Timur? It was very much. And we also had our own experiences here in South Africa. Now, for example, a very close friend of mine who's now dead, Billy Nannan. Billy had been arrested, had been tortured. He agreed to give evidence. And when he came to court, he refused to give evidence. And that was one of the things you did in order to reduce the volume of torture that was imposed on you, you would agree to give evidence. But the idea was once you go to court, you then refuse to give evidence. They can either then charge you with the other accused or take you back. But by that time, at least that information would have been public that, that you have been tortured because you can say to court that it was under torture that you agreed to give evidence, but you are not going to give evidence against any of your uh, comrades. And that was discussed, and that was a position that we tried to instill in those of our people who are coming into to, to work here in South Africa, that, that you can do that so that it's, it's possible that you break down, and that's not treacherous, but don't give evidence against another comrade. Be ready to go and be charged and be ready to be imprisoned, which in my view, uh, Timor was ready to be imprisoned. So he, he was aware of the risk of a potential long prison term and you say he was, he was, he was ready for that? Was, was that discussed? Oh, he was certainly aware of it, and he was certainly ready to um, undertake uh, any term of imprisonment that would have been imposed on him. So I in your view, this was not a man who was scared of facing a prison sentence, even a long-term one? No, not at all, because if he was, he would not have agreed to come and work in the underground. Can, can we turn to the uh, attitude, or the policy, uh, if there was one, of the SACP in relation to its cadres um, taking actions such as uh, suicide for purposes of protecting uh, the party? Your Lordship, can I refer to the document? Yes. It's uh, the document called Inkulo February 1972. And uh, just, in just, my just, view... So, sorry, Mr. Uh, your Lordship, the document he's, he's referring to is Inkulo Freedom, dated February 1972, number two. It's in uh, volume C, 
at page 15. Please proceed. In my view, the concluding paragraphs under the <coughs> subheading stand firm. And, and, and that's on the last page, is it? That's page on the seven. last page. Well, it would be the last, uh, yeah, that would be the last page. Is an absolute fabrication by the South African Security Police. It has nothing to do with the rest of the Inkululeko document. And I think if you read it carefully, you'll be able to tell that it actually is a translation from the Afrikaans. Um, for example, they use the word here, if I may uh, quote from it, Your Lordship. Make sure your complaints and actions against the suppressors get the utmost publicity. There's no such word. And none of us would ever use the word suppressors. You would always use the word oppressors. I would guess that it's a, some translation from, from the Afrikaans. So that, 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 that mm -hmm. certainly would be one. And uh, secondly, that in the very last paragraph, a number of people's names are mentioned, a concoction of names, Roly Arnstein, Vernon Berenjay, Izzy Mazels, M.D. Naidu, George Bezos, Sogot, and others who have been fighting with us since the days at Livonia. In my view, the SACP would never have mentioned those names in this document or never have said that these are people working with us, because what would that mean, working with us? Because Izzy Mazels was a lawyer. George was a lawyer. They were defending our people in the political trials. And I think this was a fabrication in order to try to implicate some of these uh, lawyers and, and that in, in things that they were not doing or were not responsible for. So my very firm view is that those paragraphs under the subheading stand firm is an absolute fabrication by the special branch attached to the thing to try to indicate that the position of the SACP was that you should commit suicide uh, if necessary. And my view is very clear. I am not aware, and have been a member of the party for a long time, having been involved in political education work with cadres that were coming back into this country, having also gone to Angola for military training in the Kashito camp, that it has never been part of the policy of the party or the ANC or any protocol and you will never find it in any documents of the party or the ANC where anybody would have been asked to commit suicide. It just is not possible. No, the party would never have said it, the ANC would have never said it. If, if we can return for a moment to um, uh, your last discussion with uh, Mr. Timo, um, in your affidavit, you, you make a reference. You say, in our last discussions, we had agreed that Ahmed should not commit suicide. In what, in what context was that, was that raised? The context was that we were also discussing how the security police and the state agencies and how the courts themselves in South Africa were responding to the deaths of detainees. And you will recall that absurd statements were made such, such as somebody slipped on a bar of soap. Somebody fell down a flight of stairs. That they will make up these stories. And in the, course of, in the context of that discussion about how the state structures would respond to the death of a detainee. We then discussed this matter other, uh, that uh, Timor would never commit suicide. And why do you say that um, knowing Mr. Timor, uh, that he would never commit uh, suicide? Well, I think additionally, there are two additional reasons I give in the affidavit. One, Timor himself was a Muslim, brought up as a Muslim, from, uh, and his parents were very pious, religious people. And a Muslim, in terms of 
uh, Islamic edicts should not and cannot commit suicide. And if you do, you will not be able to be buried in a Muslim gravesite. So just from that point of view, it seemed to me that uh, as a Muslim, Timor would have been not in a position in which he would have wanted to commit suicide. The other reason was also that whilst he was in exile, he met uh, Ruth Longoni. Um, they fell madly in love. They really wanted to spend time together. At one time, they even thought of getting married until Timol agreed to leave her behind and come and work in the underground. Now, remember that Ruth could not join him here because of the uh, Immorality Act. As a person of Indian origin, she would have been arrested if he was uh, seen uh, living in cohabitation, never mind sleeping, uh, with a white woman. So she had to stay behind in England. And, and for me, always, Ahmed was going to come back to Ruth. And Ruth always thought that at some point, Timor would come back to her. And therefore, the idea that Timor would commit suicide, for me, just doesn't seem plausible at all. Thank you, Mr. Mahal. <coughs> no, no further questions. No, I'm aware that the party was issuing in Kululeko. I'm not aware of this particular issue because I didn't work on it. Uh, but uh, having been given sight of it, I'm absolutely clear that those last few paragraphs are a fabrication. Did you work on other publications? I did. I, I was on the editorial board of the African Communist as well as uh, another general of the party, Umsa Benzi. No questions, ma'am. I also have no questions. The, the discussion you had with Mr. Timo before the death, could it be possible that in addition to that, he might have had discussions with Dr. Dadu or with the <coughs> Jeff Austin? Oh, well, I'm sure that you would have had, certainly have had discussions with uh, Dr. Dadu, um, because it, Dr. Dadu was one of the leaders of the party, and Dr. Dadu recruited him to uh, to go and come and work in the underground of the SACP. What those discussions were, I have no idea. He never told me what they discussed, and we never discussed what was discussed between him and Tatu. He might have had similar discussions with my brother Aziz. Uh, we were living in the same flat. And again, I'm not aware of any discussion that he had with him, nor did he ever tell me what discussions he might have had with Aziz Bahad before he left uh, London for South Africa. Would it be possible that they might have discussed the question of suicide? Sorry? Would it be possible that they might have discussed the question of suicide, of being committed to suicide? Your Lordship, I cannot comment on because I don't know what they would have discussed, but I would have no doubt in my mind that Yusuf Dadu would never have ever discussed. I mean, knowing Yusuf Dadu as I did, and having worked under him for so many years, uh, that he would have ever discussed the matter of suicide. That was not part of the policy. It would be most strange if Dadu, as a leader of the Communist Party, South African Communist Party, would, would discuss that matter, because it was never part of, of the party's policy. Last question for me. Uh, to your knowledge, do you know if before 1971, if there was any member of the South African Communist Party who is said to have committed suicide in South Africa in prison? No, Your Lordship. I'm not aware of anybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for speaking a bit loud.
Note that concludes the, the evidence uh, for today. Um, note tomorrow we have um, two important witnesses, two forensic pathologists, that's Professor Holland and Dr. Naidu. And uh, we'll kick off with Professor Holland in the morning and we'll call uh, Dr. Naidu uh, after she has finished. But we, we do expect to probably use up much of tomorrow with those two witnesses. Uh, I beg your pardon. Uh, uh, so on, th on Thursday, um, there is a slight change. Um, the prosecution will commence with uh, Mr. Don Foster in the morning. And once he is done, um, we're then going to have Mr. Frank Dutton, the private investigator for the family. And that'll be it. Yeah. Yes. Um, I, I want to hear the evidence of Mr. Kassi at the end. At the end. We'll yeah. make sure he comes at the end. Yes. I'm giving him the honor to be here at the end. We are here because of him. That's right. So uh, there are interesting points he raised there, uh, which we shall try to, to discuss with him. That's why I want to be here at the end. As the court pleases. Well then, again until tomorrow, can you talk? Um, Lord, Lord. Uh, please, Lord. Um, Lord. Um, Lord, before we adjourn, uh, there is just one issue uh, in respect of Mr. Rodriguez that, that I wish to uh, argue or address his lordship on. Uh, I have not had yet an opportunity to give my learned colleagues copy of the point which I want to raise. It's only in respect of the missing portion of the record concerning the evidence given in the 1972 uh, inquest proceedings that Mr. Rodriguez has testified to. I have not yet had an opportunity to prepare uh, arguing oral in court and I have only given my colleagues these documents now. Uh, if his lordship is uh, inclined to also hear this point tomorrow, I, I would beg leave to end up a document which I have prepared Lord, just for that point. Well, you want us to hear a motion? Is a motion that one is it's, it's, it's not a motion, my Lord. Yes. It's just uh, the participation of uh, Mr. Rodriguez uh, yes. in, in, at this stage of the proceedings, my Lord. Uh, with the circumstances that we have concerning the record of the inquest proceedings of 1972. Yes, that record, for, for reasons I do not understand, the record does not have the evidence of all the policemen who yes. have evidence and some of the uh, investigators. Uh, that's the missing part of the record. Yes, for that. And uh, I, I have the rest of the other witnesses who testified as well as the judgment by the magistrate. I have seen that. Lord. Yes, and the magistrate does sum up I know. some of what transpired exactly. in the proceedings. That is process we can get to the proceedings. Yes, sir. How much evidential value will place on that is something that we will add in the end. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, but, but the, uh, the is a you want us to deal with this thing tomorrow. If it pleases the court, my lord, because I have not yet had an opportunity to prepare myself. I have only drafted a concise set of submissions on that point, uh, which I wish to address tomorrow. Okay. And uh, also to give my, my colleagues an opportunity to consider that point as well in my submissions on that point. Yes. As it pleases the court. summary of this book. So Thursday is a good idea that we can do the argument seeing that tomorrow we will have uh, the, 
the evidence of the medical personnel tomorrow, and the doctors tomorrow, that Thursday possibly, if we want to prepare something. But this evidence won't be long, two hours. Would rather we hear this argument on table? I think so, uh, seeing that it's quite complicated, the evidence that's going to be led tomorrow. And to give us time to do a little bit of preparation, Mr. Yes, Yes, but Lord, I would agree with the submission of Mr. Pretorius. That would suit me, my lord.